had to begin with a little glinka here. We couldn't really begin with an int- our, one of our usual introductions today because the, the, the subject matter is indisputably weighty. It's weighty, and at the same time, it has the pressure of the absurdity of modern life, uh, a special kind of absurdity, and a special kind of Russian kind of absurdity that their writers are so good at grasping at at times. We're going to tell the story of the daughter of Joseph Stalin today. Uh, her story in, in itself is, you know, I mean... If, in fact, you could somehow or other divorce it from the story of her father, it would be an amazing story that sprawls across the 20th century and intersects with some of the most interesting people uh, of the 20th century, ranging from the the philosopher Isaiah Berlin to to the writer Jerzy Kaczynski to most especially the family of Frank Lloyd Wright. Not so much Frank Lloyd Wright himself, but the sort of the the dynastic remnants of the Frank Lloyd Lloyd Wright family. Uh, But we have to begin where we must begin, obviously, and that is um, in Russia and during the childhood uh, of our protagonist. Uh, Later on in the show, you're going to meet Ramona Rail. She's the wife of Robert Rail, who was a CIA operations officer. He was actually an undercover officer uh, in, uh, in India whose cover was blown, essentially, by the fact that he had to help uh, Svetlana Stalin or uh, Svetlana Aleluyeva. I've been practicing. Uh, I hope I did it right. Uh, that he had to help her uh, defect. Also, later you'll talk to Stephen Cohen, or we'll talk to Stephen Cohen. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of Russian studies, history, and uh, politics at, NY- at NYU and Princeton. He's the author of The Victim's Return, Survivors of the Gulag After Stalin. One of the things we'll talk about in our final segment is how Stalin himself is perceived in Russia today. And it may, I may if, unless you followed it carefully, it may actually surprise you uh, how he is understood. Uh, but uh, with us for the entire time. Joining us from Chile um, is uh, Rosemary Sullivan. She's Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto, the author of 14 books, uh, many of them biographies, and she is, in fact, uh, most recently the author of Stalin's Daughter, The Extraordinary and Tumultuous Life of Svetlana Aleluyeva. First of all, Rosemary Sullivan, am I saying that last name correctly? Am I pronouncing that? Uh, Give me some help here. Yes, you are absolutely correctly. That's as close as an English speaker can get to uh, the Russian. I'm certainly doing a better job of it than uh, than Chester Bowles, the uh, former governor of Connecticut and ambassador to India, did when it, one of his first notes about it, when she completely misspelled uh, this, <laughs> this woman's name. He kind of f- tried to do it phonetically. He didn't even do it right there. So we, I guess we have to we, think of Alleluia. I, 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 that had occurred to me, actually. Well, maybe we should begin by saying why why her name is that, right? She chose that name rather than being Svetlana Stalin, correct? Yes, around the age of uh, 27, after her father's death, she decided she would change her name to her mother's name, which was the right of every Soviet citizen. So she began to call herself Alulyeva uh, as a repudiation, really, of her father's name. She said her father's name in her mouth sounded like a, uh, a razor blade. You know, one of the things that your book tries to probe is, obviously, it was not always thus, uh, that as a child, she had, you know, I mean, an unusual father, a father who wasn't around all the time, but from what you can tell anyway, um, a somewhat affectionate father for a guy who, you know, who's got the blood of millions and millions and millions of people on his hands. He he comes across as a borderline charming father, at least in her, her younger years, correct? Absolutely. She used to talk about uh, her first six and a half years before the suicide of her mother as the golden years of my childhood, because it was a kind of Chekhovian childhood with uh, aunts and uncles and grandparents coming in and out. And her father was always the uh, conciliator. If her mother was hard on Svetlana because she had a kind of Bolshevik discipline, her father would step in and, and placate his daughter. And according to uh, witnesses of the time, such as Khrushchev, it was always a surprise to see how Stalin could be sentimental towards this little girl. Although I think Khrushchev did at one point describe it as the interest a cat has in a mouse, too, that there was... (laughs) Right. There's some kind of sense that, you know, that obviously he was very affectionate towards his daughter, but he was still Stalin. Right. So in a way, he probably was never not playing some kind of power game. I think that's absolutely right. In fact, the uh, picture we picked on the cover for the cover of the book is a portrait of Stalin uh, in a, holding Svetlana around the neck. And it's a kind of very ambiguous image because on the one hand, it's affectionate. On the other hand, it's rather scary. Right. It, it, so, uh, it, it is the embrace of a cat with a mouse, kind of. <laughs> uh, 
And also, Khrushchev talked about uh, Stalin treating her like a big bear. You were always afraid he would uh, overwhelm her. But in, in that, uh, that childhood, if you're a child of six and a half and you suddenly lose your mother, and in the secret world of the Kremlin, uh, it was, of course, never spoken of that Svetlana's mother had actually committed suicide. Suddenly, her mother just disappeared, and uh, her father became the only source of uh, familial affection in that family. Well, and, and, uh, and, and... a moving moment when Marsha Peshkova, her childhood friend who was the granddaughter of, uh, of the writer Gorky, described walking into a room. Uh, Marfa was seven years old. Svetlana was sitting on the floor cutting up a, bla- a piece of black material, and she said, uh, this is my mommy's dress. My mommy's dead. I want my dolls to wear my mommy's dress. And the, uh, the sadness of that, the tragedy of that, I think is overwhelming. Well, you know, we all grow up in families, and, and judging from your name, you, like me, may have grown up in an Irish family. Uh, totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we, so we grow up in families in which many things are not spoken of, and that there's information that is repressed, there's drama that's not spoken of. It's sensed, it's felt, uh, but it's not there. Uh, and, and there's obviously a tremendous amount of denial at work in many families, especially many Irish North American families. Um, but this takes it up a notch, right? I mean, we start, yes, with the death of her mother when she's six and a half half. Her mother shoots herself in her heart, but she's told, uh, the young Svetlana is told that it was a appendicitis and doesn't find out for more than a decade what the actual truth is. But it's not just her mother, right? I mean, you, you were saying that her father was the only source of familial affection. Well, that begins to get ratcheted up because members of the, of the larger family, the extended family, just start vanishing, right? Vanishing without explanation. Uh, one has to keep constantly in mind how old Lana was. So when the Great Terror began in 1937, she was only 11 years old. And suddenly she has a personal guard who accompanies her to school. She's not allowed to eat with the other children. She had a uh, little boyfriend with who, you know, whom she exchanged uh, little love notes, and suddenly he disappeared. And there was never an explanation. Then uh, her favorite aunt and uncle, uh, Alexander, uh, and his wife, the Sunitses, uh, were sent off to uh, the Lublianka and eventually executed in 1941. Then uh, a, an uncle, uh, Stanislav Reddins, is, is executed. Then a, another uncle dies of a heart attack, and there's no explanation. As uh, Solana herself put it, this was in a, a family in which nobody said anything. It was safer not to speak. So uh, it always seemed that something terrible was going on and that Papa couldn't have known about it. It was some kind of terrible mistake. So the slow, gradual discovery uh, of what was going on didn't occur to Solana until she was about 16. And that occurred because uh, she had fallen in love with a much older uh, filmmaker. It was a kind of 16-year-old's romantic obsession. There was no physical relationship. And when her father found out that uh, this Alexei Kepler, a very well-known filmmaker, had been walking through the parks with his daughter and taking her to the opera and so on, this man was immediately uh, arrested and uh, deported for five years first to the Lublianka in solitary confinement and eventually to the Gulag. And suddenly, Svetlana understood this was her father doing this. Right. The- and yet, as you say, I mean, as you're a Irish, uh, as an Irish person, you understand what familial roots are. So yeah, uh, there was always a small ambivalence because the good memories of that family time, the first time she drove with her father and got his uh, approbation, his approval, those memories stayed, so it was an incredible schizophrenic conflict to live. And, you know, what's happening out out around her, outside her, in the hinterlands? I mean, one thing about Russia is it's really big. So if you're going to commit <laughs> if you're going to commit atrocities, you can really kind of spread them out and you can get them at a considerable geographic distance from where you <laughs> actually are. So from 1929 to 1953, there's an almost unabated tide of blood. Tens of millions of people die through the policies and through the will of Joseph Stalin for various reasons, uh, because of forced collectivization, because of the gulags, because of concentration camps, uh, just, just this incredible human toll. And, and then you look at this little girl and you think, well, why, why would it have taken her so long to grasp that? But, but some of it is 
that it really could be spread out, right? It could be stuck in a place where it wasn't easy to see. I sometimes think the best thing to do is to read Vasily uh, Grossman's uh, Life and Fate, because it gives you a portrait of what um, the uh, isolation of people was, the information uh, that didn't get transported from one person to the other. If you have a climate of fear, people don't speak, because to speak is to put yourself at terrible risk. So yes, there was a huge climate of secrecy around anything that happened. If your neighbor disappeared, you looked the other way, because it might mean you were the next one. And uh, actually, uh, Lana always made the point that to demonize her father was to misunderstand him. He was not uh, mad. In fact, all his movements were calculated. It was a cold calculation that he sought to reach the apogee of power. As uh, she said, he, he never suffered pangs of conscience. There were, for him, three kinds of people. He didn't romanticize people. There were the strong who were needed, the equals who were in the way, and the weak who were of no use to anyone. So it was a brutal uh, system. And for her, the thing that so often was misunderstood that her, was that her father uh, moved through a system that facilitated his dictatorship. Right. And, and I mean, the other thing that's, that you can't unthread it very easily from the bloody legacy of Stalin is that he is the absolute pivotal modernizer of the country, that while he's doing all this completely horrible stuff, he's also taking them from, you know, a pretty backward nation, even for that moment, you know, even for the late 1920s. He's taking them from that to ultimately an industrial power, a military power. He will guide them sometimes well, sometimes poorly through World War II. He, he is the great transformer uh, of Russia, which is one of the reasons that it was sort of easier to burnish his image even after his death than, than it was to really examine the, the, the huge human toll. That, that whoever this guy is, he's in his own horrible way a very effective leader. I spoke to his nephew, the son of uh, his uh, son, Vasily, who said what you must understand is that uh, Stalin uh, had consummate intelligence, consummate will, and consummate evil. But that intelligence was extraordinary. And it is astonishing, I mean, to go from uh, the feudal czarist system to become a rival power to the United States in a number of decades was an extraordinary achievement. And it was on the backs of the people, because the collectivization was a consequence of... Uh, the need to export grain outside the country in order to buy uh, industrial equipment. Uh, so his achievement uh, was something that Russia, Russia can't overlook. This was a man who took them into the uh, uh, apogee of the 20th century. Uh, he also, I mean, I, there are many historians who say if uh, Stalin had not defeated uh, Nazi Germany, the war would have gone a very different way. So he's both astonishingly heroic on one hand, or at least effective, as you put it, and on the other hand, um, disregards the price, the human toll that those achievements cost. For his daughter, I think uh, she felt that the price was way too high. And, and the other thing that happens as she gets older, as we see in your book, we're talking to Rosemary Sullivan, by the way, her book is Stalin's Daughter, The Extraordinary and Tumultuous Life of Svetlana Aleluyeva. And she's joining us from Chile. I have to say that ordinarily we would do this through a studio-to-studio -studio connection. But Chile, as you may know, is in the grip of a protracted education worker strike that's also drawn in other constituencies. Somehow or other, this all seems very fitting, <laughs> given the topic. <laughs> so, uh, so this is why we're talking by phone. Um, so... You know, we talked about the relationship of father to young child as maybe a little bit cat and mouse, maybe a little bit big bear who, who, who might just accidentally maul uh, his offspring. But as she gets older, the cat really comes out, right? I mean, as she gets a little bit older, more self-assertive, more aware of what she wants. I mean, you already talked about the exile of Alex, Alexei uh, Kapler, who may have been the great love of her life and sort of the ultimate on-again, off-again <laughs> relationship. Um, but, I mean— uh, sending him to the gulag was just one of many things that, that he began to do to make it clear who was the king and who was the pawn. But Lana would say that her relationship up to that, the, well, until 1941 with her father was a loving relationship. 
I had the uh, great good fortune when I was in uh, in Russia for a month to go to the uh, state archives of sociopolitical history and find the correspondence between Stalin and his daughter, she being from the age of 7 to 16, uh, and you discover that uh, he used to direct her, never ask, always command. And so he called her the hostess, and he sometimes called himself the uh, your uh, loving papa, the peasant, Joseph Stalin. Uh, and uh, in those... Uh, Loving letters he would send. He would send a lot. He would be in uh, in uh, Sochi, uh, taking his protracted uh, retreats where he was working on uh, many of the purges. But meanwhile, sending her tangerines and so on. Uh, and uh, by the age of sixteen, she decided to stop playing that game, and then began to look at what it, what was the um, real role of her father in the Soviet Union. After the, um, can you imagine, you know, you're 16, your lover is sent to the gulag, and you understand that it is your fault. And at the same time, her father warned her. He said, take a look at yourself. Who would want you? Right. You hear that from your father. So she began to, to, um, to be skeptical about the image of Stalin. But as early as 1935, the cult of personality of Stalin uh, was everywhere. When she walked up uh, the stairs of her school, she would confront an image of uh, Stalin and an image of Lenin. Uh, she would be asked as, as a child uh, to write down all the uh, places in Russia that in the Soviet Union that uh, carried his name. No one questioned Stalin. He was the man who won the war. But after after 1942, uh, and what he felt was, uh, for him, um, a promiscuous relationship that she had established with this uh, Alexei Kapler, he, he, he virtually disowned her. In 1944, she married a, uh, a, a young man, Moratsov, who was Jewish, uh, and uh, Stalin refused ever to meet him, and he met his grandson only four times. So the alienation between father and daughter continued, but there was nothing that Svetlana could do without her father's permission. So when that relationship disintegrated, she had to ask his permission for a divorce. She married again uh, to uh, a, um, a member, a son of one of the members of the Politburo, uh, Zdanov, and uh, uh, again had his permission to divorce this man. So it's very complicated. And it's quite amusing, and uh, when she finally asked her father uh, uh, and said that she and her husband, Zdanov, were not, uh, there was no compatibility and she would be seeking a divorce, he said, um, I don't believe in, in divorce and I don't like your attitude toward the family. Family is important. And <laughs> you're thinking, this is Stalin talking. Right. <laughs> Um, well, you know, it, it, Rosemary Sullivan, it, it, this, the book kind of raises one of those unanswerable existential questions, which is we, we look at the woman that Svetlana was, the girl she was, the woman she became, a woman who, it's right there in your, tub, your subtitle, had a tumultuous life, a much married woman with many other relationships that uh, didn't uh, amount to marriage, but, but may have been even, you know, ultimately as important, but a woman of incredible passions, uh, a woman of a, with a terrible temper with an almost uncheckable imp- uh, impulsive side uh, that caused her just uh, untold amounts of trouble. And, and a, a woman who sometimes could make rather cold-blooded decisions of her own, particularly vis-a-vis her family. When she does defect, she does leave behind her two blood children, the two children she has at that point. Uh, they they are, are left behind. They're 21 and 16 at the time, but they're still uh, her children. And you have to ask yourself after a while, is she more like her father, or just naturally more like her father, than probably she would care to admit? Or is she so damaged by the crucible in which she is forged that she, she develops the kind of personality that she has? And I suppose that really is the kind of question that, that's hard to answer. You know, is it, was she a chip off the old block, or does she get chipped by the old block? <laughs> Nicely put. Um, I would say that I try to leave the answer to that question to the reader, uh, to keep some distance from imposing my own uh, interpretation. But frankly, um, when Svetlana uh, was allowed out of the country, out of the Soviet Union for the very first time, 
I mean, she was 41 years old. She made a trip to India. It was her first experience of a foreign culture. It was thrilling for her. She wanted permission to stay on and found that as Stalin's daughter, she wasn't going to be allowed by the uh, by Kusigan and company to stay in, in, the, in, in India. She had gone to India because uh, the man she had loved, Brajev Singh, whom she hadn't been allowed to marry, uh, had died, and she was suddenly given permission to carry his ashes back to India. So she's on a plane, not with the man uh, whom she'd hoped to see her husband, but with his urn, so that she can carry out a ceremony, a burial ceremony on the Ganges. And why is that? Because uh, of the political relationships between India and, uh, which is very, very dependent for armaments on the Soviet Union, everything about her life was politicized. And so on an impulse, and that's the, I think that's the core of Lana's character. On an impulse, she decides to walk into the Soviet Union and ask for asylum. When she um, uh, and of course um, this complicates uh, relationships between the Soviet Union and uh, and um, in, uh, and uh, in, the United States yes. in the midst of the Cold War. And the Americans don't want her at that moment. The, the uh, uh, Johnson administration looks for another place to, to, to uh, store her, and she gets stashed in Switzerland. In Switzerland, she begins to read Pasternak's um, um, Dr. Zhivago, which, of course, had been available for a long time, but on, uh, uh, not, uh, not um, published in, uh, in uh, Russia. And she begins to ask herself, did she really understand what it would mean to lose her children? One of her, her daughter was actually just about to turn 17. Her son was 22. Uh, he was a uh, already at medical school. Each had close relationships with her, with their fathers. When I talked to uh, Alexander Bedonsky, her brother Vasily's son, he said that uh, he didn't um, fault the Kalama for that impulsive decision to leave, because she was always looking for a way to escape this terrible shadow. Of her father's legacy. True, although I think it, it uh, may have taken him. I think she calculated the cost. Yeah, I think it may have taken him a while to get to that point. Hey, um, uh, Rosemary Sullivan, we're going to grab a quick break here, and since we're beginning to talk about the defection itself, we'll add to the conversation Ramona Rail, who was uh, an eyewitness to some of those events. <laughs> All right, we're back. We're talking about the life of the daughter of Joseph Stalin, uh, the extraordinary and tumultuous life of Svetlana Alelujeva. Uh, this is a biography by Rosemary Sullivan. Rosemary Sullivan is joining us uh, by phone from Chile. Uh, we're also uh, going to be joined by Ramona Rail, who uh, was an eyewitness in many ways to the, the actual defection uh, in uh, 1967 of, uh, of Svetlana. Uh, her husband was at that point a CIA, CIA officer, although um, undercover uh, with a different job in the U.S. government in, in India, uh, and he was the person, he was sort of the hands-on the per- person, the person who really uh, assisted uh, Svetlana in, and guided her out of uh, India and guided her defection, and it, this forged a lifelong bond for the rails uh, with uh, Svetlana. So uh, Rosemary is still with us. Ramona Rail is joining us now. Um, so um, Ramona Rail, tell us what you remember from th- that extraordinary first uh, uh, encounter the, the the first knowledge that you got that in fact your 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 husband was going to be dealing with the daughter of Joseph Stalin. Do you remember sort of when the news came in? I remember it quite clearly. Actually, it was rather unfortunate. Uh, I had um, gone with a friend uh, for a weekend with our children in the mountains of uh, India. Uh, and uh, just as I was leaving, uh, Bob called me and asked me please to bring a suitcase to the airport with some things he was going to make a trip and then he explained to me briefly that there was a woman uh this woman that he was going to travel with uh was um suspected to be or claimed to be Stalin's uh, daughter but they weren't certain of that and um the minute I got back from our I guess it was a uh, weekend trip uh to the mountains with our children uh the phone was ringing and uh, the, uh, I picked up the phone, and, this is, and the voice said, this is Tony Lucas from the New York Times. I understand 
that your husband is a CIA agent and that he's with uh, Svetlana uh, Stalin's daughter in Rome. And uh, so this was news to me because I hadn't, I had been out of touch uh, until that time. So it was all uh, rather taken, I was quite taken aback, but it, it confirmed what uh, Bob had told me that, you know, might well be the truth. Uh, so anyway, very quickly after that, I had uh, contact with our embassy a press officer, and he said, uh, yes, and, uh, you know, just lie low. <laughs> wait for this to blow over. And so that was my first confirmation that she was uh, actually Svetlana. Uh, and, and, and Rosemary Sullivan, what's happening meanwhile is this um, this moment, which you describe as kind of a thriller that begins to turn into a farce at a certain point. The Americans are trying to get her from, well, they get her from India to Rome, but the whole idea is to make this all happen before, A, the Indian government, government and B, uh, the government uh, of the USSR realize what's happening and and and, and try to do something to to prevent this. And we don't have time to go through all of the steps of this. And it's actually uh, worth reading that that part of the book all by itself because it's just such an amazing story. Although the thing that jumps out at me, Rosemary, is the moment at which they're trying to get Svetlana onto a plane so that they can get her out. I think to to Switzerland at that point, and they actually put her like on one of those little baggage trolley things that has like a tractor that pulls the luggage out. And, and that's the plan, right? They're going to take her out to the, tra- the, the, the plane in one of those, those little tractor things that pulls your luggage cart. <laughs> that was Bob Rail's wonderful story. He was saying that uh, he, he uh, was supposedly traveling with his wife. But Lana was posing as his wife. And uh, then the Italians were afraid that they would be photographed together. Uh, and so they had to separate them. So he was on the plane waiting for his wife, who supposedly had gone to the bathroom. Meanwhile, she was uh, being brought to the plane by uh, by car, and there was press descending. So then they, they uh, the Italians had a second plan, which was to bring her in a baggage cart. And so she got squeezed into the baggage cart and approached the plane, and that, too, didn't work out. So she ended up being parked in a... Uh, a uh, warehouse uh, alone for a good 45 minutes waiting to find out what happened. Meanwhile, Bob Rail told me that he was afraid that perhaps the Italians had arrested her. It was quite a farce. Yeah. So, um, R- Ramona Rail, th- an extraordinary thing happens. It's, at least it seems to me extraordinary, which is that um, I wouldn't expect that a CIA case officer uh, in a situation like this and his wife would develop the kind of relationship that you developed with Svetlana. But this relationship spanned decades uh, of correspondences, staying in touch, personal visits. Why did that happen, do you think? Why did you and your husband forge this bond with this woman? Well, I think uh, there were probably several reasons. Uh, uh, Bob had dealt with um, defectors, uh, from the Soviet Union before, and I had met them, and uh, we had tried to, you know, befriend them in ways because they uh, they often find themselves in positions of, um, you know, somewhat regret from wh- for what they had what they've left behind, and that the new life doesn't seem quite so charming. So there was that element, in, and uh, also I think Svetlana always enjoyed remembering that um, that first week that she and Bob spent together, and they, you know, were very, became uh, quite friendly uh, during that time, and I think it was her sense of freedom and having escaped and the excitement, I think that, you know, bonded them at that time in a way, and then I think she felt that he could understand some of her political feelings. Uh, She she could talk with him because he had a background in in Soviet affairs. Uh, in a way that uh, allowed her to express a lot of her anxieties about what was going on in Russia and that she, he wasn't somebody that would be uh, not, um, you know, familiar with this. And so I think that, and, and then, of course, we, uh, you know, she was an interesting person. We were eager to maintain contact with her. She had a lot of, a lot of interesting um, and challenging uh, aspects. So uh, there was all of that. Um, she is, it's clear from Rosemary's book that she was at times a very, very difficult person, a person with a, a powerful temper. Yeah. Um, did, did you like her? Did you, uh, did you always like her? I, <clears throat> well, I had moments in which I uh, felt like uh, we had come to, you know, barriers that um, I couldn't, <laughs> um, 
I wasn't prepared for it because I innocent little things like uh, I remember <clears throat> sending her uh, one of those you know Christmas letters that you write about your family and mm-hmm. getting a irate phone call from her saying, "Moni, how could you do this?" I have grandchildren in the Soviet Union. I don't even know their names, and you write to me glowing words about your grandchildren. You know, and I, without, of course, that would be a sensitive point. And without, uh, you know, she said, send me a card with a line on it and your name, but don't send me that stuff. So I felt very much rebuked, and I said, of course, I will never do it again. And uh, But I did, yeah, there were times when uh, she touched on things that I felt I needed to respond and to give her back, you know, some of what she had given. I didn't, I tried not to always be the one that was just, you know, swallowing it and, and, and tried to explain to her some of the things that um, that I thought she was misunderstanding about me, too. So it was a friendship that, you know, had limits, of course. She didn't fully understand me, and I certainly didn't fully understand her, but I, I felt... Um, I felt a commitment to her, and she loved getting letters, and she wrote, uh, she you know wrote enthusiastically, and she expected quick responses. <laughs> so this was a challenge, and uh, sometimes her, uh, you weren't sure whether you really wanted to open one of those letters because they could be quite explosive. But but understanding that she needed to vent. You know, I, I want to go back to those first uh, anxious days uh, in India and in Rome, uh, and. Um, uh, I will be more interested in this one aspect of it than anybody else who does a show or an interview uh-huh. about about Rosemary's book. But because I'm in Connecticut, um, I'm interested in the role of Chester Bowles. Chester Bowles was the ambassador to India at that time. He was yes. the governor of Connecticut at another time. He was a close right. associate of the Kennedys. That's why he wound up getting this. So he was in a very difficult position because India had a close relationship with the USSR. They weren't really, the Indian government was not interested in doing something that would be embarrassing, humiliating, or seen as an, an assault on on the Soviet uh, reputation at that time. So how did you how did your husband and uh, and the other people who were kind of working around this handle the relationship with the ambassador Chet Bowles? I, he was nothing but generous and kind and supportive. He had a great interest in India and of course was interested in uh, the Soviet Union. He was extremely supportive uh, when um, Bob went off. There was a question about whether or not uh, he would be allowed to come back to India because of um, this, you know, exposure as a CIA agent. And Chester Bowles, you know, was extremely forceful in that and and pressed the issue so that the Indian government did allow him to come back. And um, and so uh, I, uh, he was uh, made it very clear that he was supportive of Bob personally and uh, and professionally. And um, they had us over for lunch very quickly after Bob returned. Of course, he was very interested in the in Svelana, as everybody was. But he was a, a pillar, actually, in this whole thing. Um, Ramona Rail, th- thank you so can much. I add yeah, absolutely, Rosemary. Go ahead. Just that uh, I think uh, Svelana remained uh, loyal to Chester Bowles and his great courage throughout yes. her life. What happened was that uh, as she walked in, of course, they didn't know if she was a counter agent, a fake, crazy, whatever. But uh, I think Bob asked her how many hours she had before the Soviet embassy discovered she was missing, and it, and it was discovered she had about four hours. And Chester Bold realized that she had her Soviet passport, which was unheard of. Mm-hmm. She had asked the uh, Russian ambassador to India, Benediktov, to give her her passport, and he had given it to her which uh, was unusual because normally Soviet citizens were not given their passports until they got back on the plane. So Chester Bowles realized that she could leave India legally. Mm -hmm. She wasn't uh, 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 covertly, uh, you know, um, uh, gotten out of the country by the American uh, government. She had an Indian visa, her Russian passport, her Soviet passport, and she left legally. So uh, Bowles was brilliant enough to understand that he could remain within uh, diplomatic uh, correctness and yet at the same time help this extraordinary woman. I think the thing that made it clear that even though they couldn't get their bo- her Buenos Aires checked, uh, the CIA, FBI, and the State Department had no information about her, she was carrying a manuscript, which is called 20 Letters to a Friend. 
and it was the memoir of growing up in the Kremlin. So I think he must have concluded that this clearly was Stalin's daughter. Although, in fact, yeah, they had no actual record of her existence. Uh, they weren't even sure there was such a person. Hey, we're going to have to go to a break here pretty soon. I do want to, first of all, uh, thank Ram- Ramona Rail uh, so much for joining us and sharing her memories. And I do want to say that, um, you know, we're going to have to skip over some things in this book. It's a big, sprawling book. There's a, a lot in it. And really, her uh, story it just crosses paths with, I, I don't know, Edmund Wilson. And George Kennan. I mean, you name somebody who was an interesting person in the 20th century, and it's kind of uh, you'll you'll find them somewhere in this book. Uh, but the most amazing segment, and we really don't have time to talk about it right now. But for me, one of the most amazing segments is this uh, brush she has with the family of the architect Frank Lloyd Wright. He's dead. His widow who turns out to be this Montenegrin. I mean, she really was sort of Joseph Stalin in a dress in some ways. She was this incredibly <laughs> powerful uh, and 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 kind of mega maniacal, manipulative woman who selected her as a husband for one of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, protégés and, and selected him uh, as uh, uh, as her, you know, as her her, her mate and, and was a chandler of the uh, the mysticism of Gurdjieff. And I, the, the whole thing is just an amazing segment of the book. And, and the, the fact that this guy turns out to be this horrible gold digger who uh, basically takes her to the cleaners for a lot of the money that she got from writing these books is uh, kind of heartbreaking in its own way. But uh, as I say, we have to sort of jump over that because I really want to spend a little time uh, on the present moment and how the memory of Stalin is is processed uh, by the Soviet Union today. So uh, let's grab a quick break here so we'll have to, time to do that. We'll come back after this. So Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Our interns are Anna Geismar, Katie McAuliffe, and Allison Ehrenreich. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Jersey Kaczynski. For show pages, articles, and videos of the Faith Middleton Show staff doing their famous Cossack dance, visit our website, WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, our historic and modern obsession with gold. And now, back to Colin. All right, and we are talking about the uh, life uh, and legacy of Stalin's daughter, the extraordinary and tumultuous life of Svetlana Alelujeva, to take the uh, title of Rosemary Sullivan's book. Rosemary Sullivan is joining us by phone from Chile. Uh, we're also going to be talking in this segment to Stephen Cohen, a professor emeritus of Russian studies, history, and politics at NYU and Princeton. He's the author of The Victim's Return, Survivors of the Gulag After Stalin. Um, Rosemary Sullivan, this story is so big that I can't believe all the leapfrogging we're doing and the stuff that we're having to skip because it's really just meaty and fascinating stuff. But, I mean, we really do have to sort of uh, at least pause in 1953 uh, and, and then again in 1956. Um, Stalin uh, dies uh, essentially of a stroke. Um, and uh, three years later, Khrushchev sort of says the things that nobody had been able to say or had dared to say. He gives this, what, it's a four-hour speech uh, basically saying, you know, some pretty bad stuff went down. Tell us a little bit more about that moment. The secret speech, yes. Um, uh, Svetlana had been prepared uh, because the uh, minister, McCoyan, had uh, taken her aside and said, read this, and she read it and said it was all true. Uh, uh, Khrushchev accused Stalin of inventing the cult of the personality, of uh, using uh, unacceptable methods, uh, torture, to extract confessions, uh, sending people to the gulag, he made Stalin entirely responsible for uh, the period of the terror and the period of the late 1940s, which is uh, called the anti-cosmopolitan campaign. It is also true that uh, he didn't uh, acknowledge his own responsibility for uh, famine in the Ukraine and so on. Uh, it was a way of uh, transitioning, I suppose, to a what was called the period of the thaw, and uh, all the uh, sins of the uh, Soviet system were put on Stalin's head. Right. So, um, Stephen Cohen, that's uh, exactly what I was sort of about to say, that this speech, it, it's not a speech that makes a clean breast of things, right? It, it, it owns a few things and brushes a few things aside and, and tries to make as much as of the responsibility devolve on one person uh, a, as is humanly possible. But it, it doesn't really 
you know, I mean, you've got 20 million, maybe more than 20 million people dead. It doesn't really explain what truly happened. So so what's the selection process? What does Khrushchev, uh, what is he willing to talk about and what is he not willing to talk about? Well, you and I discussed this from the American perspective, 62 years after Stalin died. Remember, Khrushchev gave this so-called secret speech to the elite of the Communist Party. 1,500 delegates met at a party congress, which had been open. Then they recalled everybody to a closed session, and Khrushchev gave this report. Uh, and he told a lot. Uh, what he tried to do, not very successfully, was to exculpate the Communist Party itself and its leadership, as you say, to put it on Stalin. And he called it the cult of the personality. But, and I talked to maybe six or seven people who were in that room at the time, who were still alive when I began to study the question in the 70s, and it was a bombshell. I mean, people wept, people fainted, people trembled, people under their breath cursed Khrushchev for saying such things. But Khrushchev pushed on against enormous resistance. And what is often forgotten, <clears throat> excuse me, I got some allergy here. Mm -hmm. What is often forgotten is that very soon thereafter, five years later, to be exact, in November 1961, Khrushchev said all of this and more publicly on national radio at another party congress when all the speeches were published in all the national Soviet newspapers. And everybody knew. Now, that so-called secret speech wasn't really secret. Uh, copies were made. And it was read at virtually every workplace, political gathering, behind closed doors. But there was scarcely an adult in the Soviet Union who, within three or four months after Khrushchev gave that so-called secret speech, didn't know about its contents. And then Khrushchev said it all in 1961, and that's when he got the party to vote to take Stalin's body out of the Lenin mausoleum. One anecdote, Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, who had spent a long number of years in the Gulag, listened to Khrushchev's secret speech on the radio in his dacha outside Moscow, and he said to his wife, I can't believe I'm hearing this. This is the end. It's now all out. So even for Solzhenitsyn, still a young man, still yet to become the Solzhenitsyn of history of Ivan Denisovich and the Gulag archipelago, this was an absolutely stunning moment. So we need to credit Khrushchev and some people who are very unhappy about the end of the Soviet Union date the end of the Soviet Union from that moment when Khrushchev began to tell the truth. You know, and, and uh, Rosemary Sullivan, it's worth saying, too, I mean, it, it's it's hard for, uh, as Stephen Cohn is saying, 62 years later, I mean, you feel like you have whatever clarity you have on this. Uh, but it's hard for us to understand sort of what was known and what was not known at each point on this continuum, you know, that that. Um, that be, partly because Russia is so vast, partly because uh, Stalin's reign lasted so long, so many things were done in so many different places, there, there was so much managing of information, even, for some reason or other, I'm on a tear about the New York Times this week, I even discovered a guy named Walter Durante, who was this uh, New York Times reporter who really loved Stalin and, and wrote all this terrific stuff about him, and, 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 and that, that it, it's it's unclear to me, Rosemary, how much anybody ever knew about Stalin at any given moment. It seems like a very muddy subject somehow. <laughs> well, it's a subject that I would leave to Stephen, who is uh, brilliant on this. I can only speak about Svetlana's experience, which was that shortly after the speech was uh, delivered, it was read at her uh, institute where she was working, the Gorky Institute. And her experience was, of course, devastating as all the uh, fellow students turned on her. Uh, and the one person who was sympathetic to her was Andrei Sinyavsky, who actually, uh, uh, as she was leaving, helped her on with her coat and she burst into tears. So the, the, uh, um, what was known and not known, um, I spoke to a, um, a friend of hers at the, uh, at the Gorky Institute, Yusupov, and he was suggesting that, uh, that um, Svetlana was at the crossroads of, uh, and of, of, the, of the tragedy of the Soviet, of the Soviet system because uh, she was both vilified 
and used by other people uh, because of her access, supposed access to power. Uh, and she made a protest against the demand that um, later, when uh, Andrei Sinevsky was uh, arrested, uh, a protest against the uh, demand that everybody sign uh, a, a, a support of the uh, of the trial of Sinevsky. Uh, and yet all of this would be carried on, you know, within the confines of certain walls and not be known abroad. So it was it was all, you know, it, it was a closed system. Uh, and uh, what what could be known, uh, even now, it's, uh, I think, virtually impossible to be absolutely sure. I think that's true. Stephen Cohn, on. we're running out of time here, and I do want you to spend a, a moment or two just sort of talking about the way in which Joseph Stalin is understood at the present moment uh, in in in, uh, in Russia, that, that in fact sure. his legacy has been almost kind of reburnished, if anything. Uh, so far as I can tell <clears throat> in history, there is no man dead 62 years who still casts such a large shadow and a divisive one on his country. Uh, since the moment Stalin died, and particularly since the moment of Khrushchev's so-called secret speech, which, as Rosemary just pointed out, was read at all the universities and workplaces of the country in 1956, Stalin's historical reputation has utterly divided Russians in particular. Uh, the public opinion polls, and they, they love to do these historical polls, so they're done three or four times a year, show fairly clearly that the country is divided between those who think Stalin was a great statesman, perhaps Russia's greatest statesman in history, because he modernized the country, because he was the generalissimo uh, during the, the historic defeat of the Nazi in, uh, armies, uh, and those who think he was Russia's worst, most genocidal tyrant, those are polarizing views. They've been there for 62 years, sometimes privately in kitchen tables uh, when the censorship was heavy, sometimes publicly during the thaw, as Svetlana, uh, as uh, Rosemary mentioned, during the Khrushchev period, very loudly during the Gorbachev era when he told the whole story. Uh, and again today, uh, and it is so divisive that as we talk, literally as we talk, monuments are being built in Russia to honor both Stalin and to honor his victims by opposing political movements. Uh, for example, in October of this year, there will open in Moscow a new and expanded Museum of the History of the Gulag. Uh, uh, paid for by the Moscow city government, which is controlled by Putin anyway. And Putin recently signed a decree authorizing and funding the building of a monument right in the center of Moscow to Stalin's victims. Meanwhile, in provincial cities around the country, busts of Stalin are being put up. So this is a country divided by Stalin, and it has political importance today, depending on the situation. So the Ukrainian crisis, to take one example, has enhanced Stalin's rep reputation because people say this never would have happened under Stalin. Mm -hmm. He would never have let NATO approach our borders. He would have never allowed the Ukrainians to do what they've done. And yet other people say, well, it was Stalin who built this crazy patchwork of a state called the Soviet Union that when it disintegrated in 1991, created all these ethnic national problems. So. Stalin hovers. You know, they used to say, when I began living in Russia in the 1970s, it seems like Stalin died only yesterday. They still say that today. That's how large and looming and divisive his historical reputation remains. Stephen Cohen, we're going to have to go here. And Rosemary Sullivan, thank you so much for the time that you spent with us today, too. This is all a consideration of her new book, Stalin's Daughter. Uh, thanks to everybody who helped out today. There's so much more I wanted to say. There's so many, oh... Very frustrating. All right. Well, maybe another time.